And you are watching PBS Books. Hi, I'm Fred Nahat. Nice to have you along with us for our series of library conversations uh, on book-related topics, introducing you to authors uh, and experts, a dialogue about uh, great ideas and connecting it all through PBS Books and uh, our great partners at America's Public Libraries. So welcome to you, uh, one and all. Uh, this week, we look at uh, mental health, May being uh, Mental Health Month, uh, of course. Uh, but you know, mental health is something uh, that may be getting overlooked uh, in the time of COVID. Certainly, uh, physical health is on our minds, as it should be, uh, but mental health uh, important as well. And that is uh, where we begin, let me welcome in uh, our featured uh, guest. It is uh, Lisa Kurzweil Kielberger. She is a faculty member at the Center for Mindfulness Studies, where she trains educators, healthcare practitioners, and corporate leaders in mindfulness based cognitive therapy and stress reduction, uh, and the author of a new book, which can be best described by its title, The Well Being Playbook. Lisa, thanks for being here on uh, PBS Books. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to join you. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, it's great to have you. And uh, if you'll pardon uh, uh, the wordplay, uh, in the best of times, uh, certainly most of us are a bit on the verge when it comes to uh, mental health. But in this, in this time of, of COVID, I guess the uncertainty of it all uh, really has dramatically increased our, uh, I guess our need, but maybe not our attention and the book is so timely, uh, and it's a great read, which we'll get into. What was the idea around the book? You're making it uh, accessible, and that's important for folks. Absolutely. So wondering, you know, how can we really simplify the daily actions around mental well-being? So the idea really came out of uh, an initiative we're working on at we called We Well Being, which was really inspired by young people telling us that they care about mental health year after year. Um, and being a, a cause inclusive organization, we really wanted to respond to that. And uh, so not only doing um, deep learning in schools, embedding mental health into the curriculum, but also sparking um, a public health conversation, uh, a broad conversation among teachers and parents and caregivers. Uh, young people themselves, but really a broad audience. So we can all um, think about what are the daily things that we can do to promote not only our own mental well-being, but the well-being of, of our loved ones and, and our communities. Well, and folks should, uh, should know that the, the well-being playbook uh, is available uh, free online. It is at we.org slash well-being. So we'll talk a little bit uh, more about that uh, as uh, we go through it. Now, we're not, of course, dispensing any medical advice on PBS books today, but you have some recommendations, and it is, I can't emphasize enough, a fun experience uh, to read and spend time uh, with uh, the playbook. It starts out uh, with the owner's manual, and I guess the idea is we don't come with an owner's manual. Uh, you're helping us with that, but like anything else in life, you got to have a plan. Absolutely. So we brought together an incredible group of experts, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, you know, mental health professionals, young people themselves, to think about what are the things that we can do to promote our own well-being. So starting with um, the operating instructions about our own brain. So what really fuels us? Things like sleep, uh, things like hydration, really making sure we're getting the, the water and nutrients that uh, fuel our body. Uh, things like connecting with each other and you know whether that's virtually right now or um, being present with our loved ones, all of these things that we do on a daily basis that really add up to promote our mental well-being. Now, let's, let's step down for, uh, for a second in terms of uh, conditions, certainly in this heightened uh, time. What does the medical chart look like? We're talking about uh, anxiety, uh, depression. What, what should we be aware of, maybe seeing the signs uh, of others uh, and for ourselves? Are those the things that uh, may be on the increase, anxiety, depression? Is there anything else? I think we're certainly seeing heightened anxiety with a lot of unknown in the situation that we're in. Um, it can raise the feeling of anxiety. Uh, and then I think the, you know, the physical distancing uh, that may 
cause isolation, which can be a risk factor for mental health issues. I think those are those are two key things to be aware of. Um, but you know, finding ways to really connect with one another that can still be social, but but really um, acknowledging the physical distancing. Uh, realities right now. So through technology and that sort of thing to really stay connected with one another and, and, you know, check in with one another, really, how are you doing today? Um, and really, really getting, keeping those connections alive, despite the physical limitations right now. Yeah, I think, I guess the issue is serious, but what, what I guess is so compelling about about this book is you make it fun and you make it engaging and the the, the names of the chapters uh, represent that. Uh, Be your own BFF is one of the chapters and that's about uh, self care and compassion and advocating for yourself. What are the, some of the kinds of things that we should do in this setting, but really uh, universally, uh, to look out for ourselves. Well, I think so often we can be really hard on ourselves, right? We can be our, our biggest critic, which, you know, having, um, it, being able to treat ourselves as we would a good friend or, you know, during a challenging time, really acknowledging that this, this can be tough and, and taking good care and um, practicing the same kindness that we do with our loved ones with ourself um, is really important. And there's, you know, lots of research now coming out on, on the power of self-compassion that um, can be as important as our self-esteem in uh, a protective factor for our mental health. And kindness is key and it's so, it's so important for ourselves. But also one of the other chapters uh, is tap into your uh, superpowers. Now we think of superpowers as vanquishing our uh, opponent or knocking down an enemy. But in this case, superpowers in the playbook uh, is that of uh, empathy and altruism and, and kindness. Talk a little bit of, about how those reflexive uh, feelings for ourselves can also extend out and then read back to us. Yeah, I think helping others is such a superpower. Not only, you know, are you contributing to your community, which is uh, such a positive thing, but it, it also makes us feel good. It's, it gets the, um, the chemicals in our brain uh, going that are like the feel good neurons. Uh, and so I think really being able to um, find small ways to help each other day to day can be um, such a powerful tool for our well being. Uh, not not to mention the impact it can have on, on people around us and, and making a positive difference. And we see this among young people every day through service learning in their classrooms. And um, you know, now that's transitioning online and, and there are still ways that young people are, are being creative in how to help one another and you know, help out at home or um, you know, all different ways that they can continue to um, support each other. Here's another fun example uh, in, in the book. Never have I seen uh, a more fun way uh, to explain uh, neurotransmitters. You got a nice picture of the brain in there. Go, th go through those three or four uh, things because, you know, when I hear uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, you know, that makes me anxious to hear that scientific language. But it, it's, such a, it's such a fun way that you're explaining our own body chemistry and how it's a process. It's a process. It's a process. So once you understand, that you can maybe get a better feeling of uh, what's going on inside of you? Absolutely. So I think this is really important, not just, um, you know, our awareness of our emotional state, but actually the physiology of things like stress, right? And how that may um, increase our cortisol, uh, which gets our body going on uh, you know, automatically jumping into a fight, flight, or freeze. And, and just knowing the physiology of our bodies can be really empowering in, in kind of getting a sense of what we're going through and how we are managing stress or stressors in our life. I also think, you know, when, when um, you're mentioning our superpowers too, resilience is such an important um, Thing to reflect on in this time because resilience isn't something that we necessarily, you know, automatically are, are born with, but opportunities like these where we're in a challenging time, it gives us the um, opportunity to build our resilience muscle. And as we're, you know, reaching out, if we need support or help, um, 
reaching out to all, all of our different resources that are available, uh, this is an opportunity to build our resilience muscle as well. And resilience is, is one of those things that when I think about um, the illustration uh, in the book of sort of the executive director of, of the brain being being free and able and confident in making your own decisions. And one of the, one of the things that's kind of nuancy to me is we, we wanna stay connected. Certainly during this time, we miss uh, the feeling of, I guess it's isolation. And we feel like we're, we're so used to human contact. We have our devices, we have our computers, our texting and the rest, but we really miss that, that human contact. Mm -hmm. And making decisions to figure out ways how to maybe in the near term substitute uh, for that. Uh, what can we find in the book that will help us, which I guess I think so many people maybe are, don't even know they're missing it, uh, but it's certainly a void in my life. How, how can we make up for that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think as much as we can uh, connect with one another, whether it's in person, over video, or even hearing a voice at the other end of the phone. I think there's you know, small things that we can do every day to intentionally connect with one another. And not just, um, you know, I think how we're connecting is important too. So really being present with one another and, and listening. And you know, this can be a really challenging time for a lot of people and, and there's a lot going on right now. So, so really um, expressing our care and, and love for each other uh, whether it's if we can through video or, um, or you know, over the phone, hearing another person's voice. I think these are all uh, wonderful ways to connect outside of our physical space. Um, and then with loved ones as well. These can be stressful times um, with kids at home or, um, you know, different changing employment situations. So really um, practicing that kindness with each other and really taking the time to to connect and be present with each other, um, being there for each other right now. Yeah, if ever there were a benefit of this is uh, to realize how, how important that is. Uh, the other aspect that I find interesting, I certainly learned uh, going through uh, the well-being playbook is, uh, and I promise this is not a gotcha question, uh, at once we recommend uh, more connection and try to fill that mm -hmm. void, but also to disconnect. And, and I think that means the device is so reboot and recharge, everything can be solved by uh, unplugging it and plugging it uh, back in. You know, uh, I guess in the uh, uh, at the academic uh, parlance, uh, connect, disconnect, compare, contrast. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So especially being online more, maybe more than usual uh, right now too, just those times, you know, technology is such an incredible, powerful tool um, to help us to connect, but also just being really intentional about our our technology use as well, how we're using it. And um, it can be used for so much good, uh, but then really setting some limitations around it. Maybe that's, you know, turning it off before we go to bed or putting it in a different room. Um, so it doesn't interrupt our, our other um, really important habits like a good night's sleep. Yeah, and that, and that, goes, uh, uh, that goes to those things that we've learned uh, in kindergarten or from our personal trainer, whomever it is, those things are so basic. Talk about uh, the sleep, uh, being hydrated. Uh, and I always love to talk about food, uh, eat, eating well. Just the basics of uh, our sustenance and our existence really play an important role uh, in our mental well being. Absolutely. So we think, you know, sometimes we can think of our physical health and our mental health as separate, but really they're so interconnected. And the nutrition was fascinating. The, the um, research that we did for that section, you know, everything that's coming out around the nutrition and mental health, it, it's just um, such interesting information to be able to see the connection. Um, you know, so much serotonin is actually um, in the gut. So, you know, how, how can this not impact our, our well-being as well? So really thinking of our, our overall, overall um, health, uh, including our mental and physical. I think one of the things that uh, brings us all together uh, is music. Like mu there's nothing like music. If you, uh, you can, the more you listen to a song or a piece, the more you enjoy it, the more it informs you. It's different than any other uh, art form. 
And you guys have had some fun uh, in this book by creating the top 10 happiest songs. How'd that come about? It was a lot of fun. So much fun. And, you know, I, I have to add, so we have a, a three-year-old um, and it's not on the list, but my happiest song right now is um, a song called Run Baby Run, just to see the joy that it brings my three-year-old son. Well, as I said, music can be such an inspiration. Uh, and it is definitely, the list is highly debatable. So that's another fun uh, reason to get uh, the book free online at we.org slash wellbeing, the wellbeing playbook, uh, perfect uh, for uh, certainly um, right now. The other thing I like about the book is, and, I'll, and I, I will only uh, uh, scoop one, uh, the topic of food. Uh, you have to see these great poll quotes from uh, philosophers of uh, every stripe. Um, when you walk, walk, when you eat, eat. And that's sort of indicative of a, a singular focus. Do one thing at a time and do it well, and then you, and then you move on. But you got all kinds of cool, fun lift quotes in the, in the book as well. Oh, thank you. Well, and such a great reminder, doing, doing one thing at a time, especially in this era where, you know, we get, there's so many distractions and multitasking, um, you know, is something that is, is really pulling our attention, but doing one thing at a time, single tasking, there's, there's something to that too. Yeah. No, <laughs> and that, I, I have to say, sure. uh, we're just so, so grateful to all the folks that made uh, this resource free and possible, like the Erica Legacy Foundation, the Jolene McCall uh, Family Foundation, the Crown Robinson uh, Philanthropies and Coach Pete Carroll. We've been so grateful to um, all of those folks to be able to make this resource free and accessible. Well, being in um, being in public television and with PBS Books, our uh, philanthropic funders make so much of this uh, possible. So definitely have no, a note of thanks to everyone that's uh, investing in our good mental health. Uh, once again, Lisa Kurzweil Kleberger, the book is the Wellbeing Playbook, and you can get it free. That's right, free. Download it online. You definitely want to do that at we.org slash wellbeing. Okay, you are watching uh, PBS Books, uh, our series of uh, library conversations joined by America's Public Libraries uh, and by our viewers. Uh, let us move now uh, to our panel. Excited to introduce uh, to you, and Lisa's gonna stay with us, uh, our panel of uh, experts uh, and friends uh, joining us here on uh, PBS Books. Uh, as we we like to explore ideas that are that are book related, uh, but also can cut a wide uh, swath of energy, exercise, and thought. And public television, PBS, uh, and certainly this book's platform, we uh, put a premium uh, on thinking and expansion. So we're glad to have you uh, along with us uh, as we turn to our panel joining us for uh, today's conversation. First. It's Megan, Dr. Megan Smith, an associate professor at the Department of Psychiatry and the Child Study Center at the Yale School of Medicine and the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences in the Yale School of Public Health, also founder and director of the nationally acclaimed Mental Health Outreach for Mothers or Moms, which seeks to improve maternal mental health among low-income women through a community-driven place-based approach. Uh, Dr. Dave Anderson is a clinical psychologist at the, and senior director of national programs and outreach at the Child Mind Institute. Uh, Dr. Anderson specializes in evaluating treating children and adolescents with ADHD, behavior, anxiety, uh, and mood disorders. Uh, he's uh, appeared on most of the major networks, the New York Times, NPR, among others. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from Dartmouth College and a doctorate in clinical psychology from Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline Sanderlin, or Dr. Jackie, is an accomplished educator uh, and empowerment speaker who also has a new book, The Why Not Challenge, 10 Steps to Empowering Communities and Developing Partnerships to Serve Children uh, and Schools. That'll be uh, released uh, this summer. She spends her days imparting her passion and deep knowledge of curriculum and instruction, uh, community engagement, partnerships, and educational leadership. Uh, and Jake Tolman. Uh, Jake is a 17-year-old student and aspiring film director in Los Angeles, California. 
Uh, Jay currently attends an art school and hopes to be able to use his own stories and experiences dealing with mental health as a means of connecting with others to show how these feelings are not singular, uh, but universal. Uh, and finally, uh, Lisa Kurzweil of Kielberger joins our panel as well. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for being here with us uh, on uh, PBS Books. So we had a, a, a great conversation uh, with Lisa sort of about uh, a reflexive uh, look at her book and how we can uh, impart self-care and care in our own small family communities. Uh, let's widen out a bit uh, and start with um, policy, public policy of behavioral uh, health uh, in our engaging panel uh, to tackle that. Um, Dr. Megan Smith, let me uh, start with you. Much of your work uh, centers around the idea that good mental health strengthens families. Uh, with, uh, with that as a paradigm, can you give us a little bit of a reverse engineering on how good mental health, a solid infrastructure, can ultimately make stronger and more successful families? Absolutely, I think, I think that's a key. You know, any good system to build mental health is a system that supports parents. Um, you know, as, as Lisa talked about this, it's so important to feel that one belongs and one's connected and um, part of a community. And that connection really essentially begins at birth with um, attachment and that bond between a parent and an infant. And we know that actually that bond and that creation of the bond is really something that imparts lifelong health and well-being. So things that we can do to strengthen that bond and importantly, things we can do to build the mental wellness of parents and caregivers are absolutely critical. So, you know, systems that we can develop to support parents and caregivers in their role as parents um, are essential. And, and, and particularly now you could argue really more than ever. Um, so if you, you sometimes might hear about that metaphor of, you know, putting your oxygen mask on first um, before you put that on your child in an airplane. And that's really what we need to think about doing for parents. How do we help them to, to take care of themselves, um, you know, so that they can really form that attachment and bond with their child. Yeah, and the other metaphor that I uh, think about this topic is uh, that, of, that of triage. In understanding there's uh, probably a need cross-sectionally at every level, every uh, age, every uh, socioeconomic status, if we were to triage uh, mental health in, uh, you know, in, in this country, Take a whack at that. I mean, what what's one, two, and three as far as uh, steps that may be uh, the most urgent? So I think, you know, particularly if we think about poverty and the impact that poverty has on mental health, that might be my one. Um, so, you know, you, you start off with public policy, so eradicating poverty, but thinking about families who live in poverty, who are at um, higher risk for common mental disorders like depression and anxiety, um, systems to support families living in poverty. Of course, we're hearing a lot about with, with COVID, um, disproportionate impacts on communities of color. And we certainly know that um, oppression, discrimination, um, multiple adversities and traumas that impact communities of color are really important. Um, and also people living with a mental illness. You know, Lisa noted, you know, one in five people um, are diagnosed with a mental illness. And uh, we need to think particularly hard about systems that engage in care. Um, you know, I will just say in terms of that policy piece, if you think about, maybe to throw one more metaphor on the table here, um, you, you know, if you think about a, a goldfish in a bowl and you think about, you know, the treatment, maybe we think about, um, you know, providing some kind of medication for the fish's gills. Well, we can treat that fish, but if we don't change the water, um, in that bowl, if we don't change that environment and that context that the fish lives in, we're not going to ultimately promote the wellness of the fish. So I think in terms of that triage system, it's both an individually focused triage, but really needs to also be something focused on the environment and context. Well, all metaphors welcome here on uh, PBS Book. Uh, let me bring in uh, uh, Dr. Jackie. Uh, doctor, your work in Los Angeles getting uh, rave uh, reviews of improving lives there. When we think about urban communities, um, are there needs uh, in, in for service and care that are unique uh, to uh, urban communities, or are the needs the same and the issue becomes uh, income and barriers to access? Uh, 
Okay. Um, well, thank you very much for asking the question. Um, and what I will say to that is, you know, I've had the pleasure of um, working in all kinds of different communities um, that vary from, um, you know, socioeconomic level to also, you know, class, race, what have you. And what I've learned in my 30 years of education, um, of working also in not just um, communities where um, poverty was very high, but I also worked in very elite areas like Beverly Hills. And, and so I've worked all across the board. And one of the things that I've learned to realize, um, and I share and dispel, try to dispel some of those thoughts that it's only in one community. Mental mm -hmm. health is in all communities. Um, I've seen it just as much in elite areas as I have also seen in urban communities. And I'm glad I have those experiences because um, they might have different triggers but they have the same outcomes. Um, and one thing I've learned is that kids are kids, uh, regardless um, of where they've come from. They might experience um, different sets of circumstances, but I've seen ADD, ADHD. I've seen, you know, um, um, children who are faced, you know, learning disabilities to severe learning disabilities. Um, someone who is taught and worked in special ed um, deeply, you know, it's just, it's one thing about looking at numbers and it's another about actually being in those communities. And, um, but yes, um, the, the, the answer, the short answer is the mental health, mental illness is every, yeah. everywhere. Um, the other short answer is um, there is help everywhere. And I think once we open up the conversation like we're doing today, mm -hmm. um, we can mm -hmm. help um, take away labels, help take away um, that, you know, demographics um, as to exactly where it is, um, you know, help also the conversation of the media, you know, as far as opening up, as you said earlier, how do we open up that understanding um, and that these strategies, they help everybody. And I think that's the whole point. Well, I appreciate it. And just a follow up, uh, a follow up uh, to that. If we, if the answer is we're all the same inside, the conditions are the same, and there are, there are different triggers, maybe access could be an issue. Is there one or two things? Are there resources that are available to help uh, guide folks through, um, I guess, their own journey to me to mental wellness? When, when it seems as though there is no place to turn, what's the best thing someone can do for their family? Well, one of the things, uh, and I'll speak as an educator, someone who's mm -hmm. worked in schools as well. I work with families all the time. We're all a community. Um, schools are changing as well. They have wellness centers um, now in many schools. Um, first, I believe, though, it starts with the belief and understanding that all children have potential. It starts also with changing our words. Like I would never ever say at risk anymore because mm -hmm. I always say every child is at potential. And when you have that mindset, that's a different mindset. That means because children know when you believe in them. So speaking into their life, even parents and you ask about families, speaking to all the children with potential telling them they're, they're doing a good job, letting them know that there is opportunity for them to grow. Everybody has the right to evolve and get better. When you speak that way, you're speaking into their life and you're actually putting a mirror to their life to saying, I can be my best self. So one, schools are starting to change that. You used to have counseling centers all the time. And then a lot of them changed to intervention centers and now when we go back, we're probably going to be seeing more prevention and wellness centers because what we're needing to do is create safe spaces for young people to talk, to share, to bond. As we just heard Megan said, it starts from um, zero to five when they're bonding, but it continues. And sometimes we forget after five how much our youth need to um, be praised, need to be um, you know, uh, reminded that they're important. And so oftentimes, you know, in the teens, and we're gonna hear from a student I know later, 
um, in high school, sometimes that gets kind of, uh, it kind of disappears when we should be even doing that more. Um, and I think when we do that, for those children who are shy, for those who um, even been bullied, cyber bullied, um, you're developing confidence in them. You're developing empowerment because if it's only from the outside, that's not empowerment. Um, you know, that's good praise, but what we wanna do is build self-empowerment where the young people don't even need us anymore. They start believing this in themselves. And so for me, um, I believe that that goes along with the foundation of what um, the playbook is all about, um, being your own BFF, you know, not just nourishing yourself with, with food, but nourishing yourself with confidence and pride. And those things really do help and go a long, long way. Uh, exhibit A on uh, how folks are benefiting uh, every day by working with Dr. Jackie, uh, students and families and the rest. Let me bring uh, Dr. Dave Anderson in here. Uh, Dave, a lot of your uh, work is with the idea of uh, emotional intelligence. This is something we've been hearing about uh, you know, in a business setting for a few years, it's important for students uh, as well to learn some of that empathy and recognize in others uh, and themselves. Uh, people's disposition is as or maybe more important um, than their intellect uh, on a topic uh, of the day. Well, I, I think what you're highlighting, which is a, a really good thing, is that we're, we're seeing more intertwining in academic settings of understanding that performance academically is linked to mental health. And I think that as you referenced, so many of the programs that we uh, run all over the country uh, from the Child Mind Institute are focused on, on kind of multi-tiered systems of intervention. So we wanna make sure that we change uh, community focus and increase the level of support and prevention in a community at the same time as we're serving uh, the kids who might be most in need of services. So we're, we're doing professional workshops for educators. We're doing, uh, you know, parent workshops to, to help think about uh, how these things might present at home. We're doing social emotional learning curricula in classrooms, uh, helping to kind of ally with teachers and supporting their students, and then also delivering treatment where the kids are in the sense that, you know, we want to solve access problems in that we want to create networks where we can say to a child, here are the places you can go within your community to find treatment without a wait list or uh, for low cost or, or in affordable ways. But at the same time, uh, so much of our work is about facilitating how schools can provide that treatment in school uh, because the child's already there and it doesn't put further stress on their family to try to find time in the afternoon uh, to visit a therapist or something like that. And, you know, I, I go back to a metaphor that I think uh, Megan was talking about earlier uh, of the oxygen mask. I always think that metaphor is funny because uh, the plane has to have an unexpected change in altitude or some sort of emergency for us to engage in that. And that's what we're in right now. Yeah. So my my hope is that as we keep talking about this idea of putting the oxygen mask on ourselves, it becomes even more imperative that we consider uh, how we can prioritize mental health uh, as we return perhaps to different semblances of uh, uh, normal life in ensuring that these resources and especially prevention efforts are, are even implemented at a higher level so that we can screen and ensure that kids who really need support are getting it. So uh, Dr. Anderson, even in the, uh the best situation of yeah. schools, creating a path, but also struggling uh, with the idea uh, of mental health. And now with the with remote instruction and distance learning in this moment, uh, what are some of the things that uh, parents and families can do in combination uh, with the educational community to support that great need uh, for mental well-being? Right. So, I mean, I think it goes back to a lot of what we're discussing here is that we we tell folks that the, the strategies for stress management, the strategies for promoting wellness have not necessarily changed. It's just that they've become that much more important. So as we check in with families past their engagement with public health practices, it's that our next check-in is whether or not people are keeping some sort of schedule or structure since days and times are blending together. It's whether or not people are getting enough sleep, eating regularly or exercising, as I think Lisa was talking about earlier. Uh, and then beyond that, it's helping with stress management strategies that are well known within psychology, but that are harder for us to apply or find the space to do so. It's helping people to get in touch with their emotions and to monitor them day to day, to think about what stressful situations cause them to feel emotions in kind of intense ways, then to make lists of even the most manageable activities. They might be able to schedule in during weeks or days 
uh, to boost mood or at least decrease their overall stress level, and then to really take a look at the things they can't change. So, so much of the things that we as psychologists speak about are about active coping. But we also want folks to realize that at some level, we want them to be in touch with their emotions without trying to change them. And to think about the fact that there are some things right now about our stress that we have to just cope with in terms of uncertainty or uh, the stress of wishing for things to return to normal. And that's something that we can all kind of band together in uh, kind of being present for. Uh, and we, we, really, we really speak to folks as well across communities about how they might be able to, fit to, to do a little bit of first aid on the key relationships, particularly in those they may be social distancing with, to, to look for moments where it's not just a release of stress, but where you're kind of cultivating joy and uh, relationship rituals with each other that uh, at least can substitute for some of the social contact we've all lost. Uh, we've been talking about um, students uh, and schools. Let's bring in an actual student, uh, Jake Tolman. Um, you are a student and you are an artist and someone that's open about uh, your experience uh, with uh, mental health. Talk about your experience uh, with uh, the organization, uh, the WE organization and, and the different trips uh, you've had and, uh, and what uh, your general sense of well-being is in this moment, uh, unprecedented for us folks who are in our 50s and for a 17 year old, it must be a lot to take. How, how, how's it going, Jake? Um, it's going well, um, thank you. Um, so my dad has worked with um, WE for a while now. Mm -hmm. and we've been on multiple trips uh, to Kenya and India um, for well-being trips and um, giving back to communities outside of our own. Um, and so it's been, it's been really um, eye-opening as I've gotten older because I've been on two now. And the first one, I was a lot younger, so I didn't really get to, I, it was more just a new place, which was a lot for me, but I never really took it all in. And so um, as I got older and I did one, I think two years ago um, or last year, um, it was uh, very eye-opening to see just how lucky I am. And I can't imagine what it's like there in this moment now um, because it's um, really hard for everybody. And um, I know that me and my family have um, had our hardships with this as well. So. Um, being lucky and still having a hard time. Um, I, I can't imagine what it's like uh, in that area at the moment. Um, and so my uh, experience so far with uh, well-being has been mainly during this time about uh, self-expression, especially as an artist. Um, I've been trying uh, as much as I can to, to write and um, use this time to to sort of um, fill up uh, free time with doing stuff that I love um, so that it isn't uh, completely time that's not being filled up with stuff that I wanna do. And um, I have a, a, a lot of my films are um, mainly based on issues that I've had and fears and struggles that I've faced. And so, um, especially in this time uh, where it's been really hard not to connect with my friends and um, to go out, and especially during junior year, um, it's, uh, it's, been, uh, uh, it's been difficult to do that. So being able to translate that through uh, something that I love, which is um, writing and filmmaking has been um, really helpful for me. Um, and I know that, um, or I hope that, um, um, with my films, I'm able to uh, connect with other people and um, sort of put into words what other people are feeling uh, for people who don't have the tools to be able to put that into words. And so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically what I've been doing. Jake, if, uh, if you have a thousand artists, you have a, a thousand different processes on how to inspire an Imagineer into uh, the final product. Do you mind telling us a little bit about uh, your process? Uh, how is it that you create and curate ideas and how does it manifest in those things uh, that you are currently and hope to create? Yeah, um, so in the past, um, I've 
used stuff that I'm feeling in that moment to uh, as a theme to start writing. So uh, for example, I think my, my first movie that I made over the summer, like my first uh, actual movie that I um, enjoyed was uh, made over the summer and I just could not come up with the idea. It took me like a week to write it. Um, and then um, like I just kept on deleting um, script after script after script. And then in the end, I, I just, I couldn't come up with anything. And I, I thought um, about writer's block um, and sort of writing about writer's block um, in my own sort of style. Um, yeah. so the theme turned into writer's block. And the second that idea came up, I, was, I wrote it in like one night. Um, and that ended up being the final script. Um, and then my next film, um, which is... Uh, more about fear. I have a huge fear of spiders and um, most of my films are um, horror movies. So um, I decided to make, um, I decided to make that one about um, overcoming, um, overcoming like a fear uh, because I feel like um, fear can be something that holds you back. Yeah. So um, I use that as like, you know, a way to overcome my fear because I actually had a buy a tarantula for the set. Um, so I, while I was making a film about overcoming a fear of spiders, I was overcoming my fear of spiders, which um, I really wanted to make sure that I focused on while I was making that, um, so that I was going through like the same thing my characters were going through. And so really, I guess what um, my, main, um, my main focus has been with writing has been um, thinking about what not only what stories I want to tell, but what emotions like mean something to me and what emotions I've felt before um, and sort of using filmmaking or writing or however um, uh, you want to portray your art as a way of um, like overcoming those emotions and um, being able to um, understand them more. And I think that's really what makes um, uh, art art is um, when you really feel the emotion um, in that piece. And so uh, that's, that's just sort of what uh, I try to portray in all of my work. Well, thank you uh, uh, for being open uh, with, your, with your view of it. Uh, uh, certainly uh, inspiring uh, to me. And to our uh, PBS Books viewers, thanks for uh, being with us. Uh, we are creating and curating a conversation here in May, Mental Health uh, Month, but really important uh, of course, uh, any time of the year. Um, Lisa Kurswell Kleberger, author of the Wellbeing Playbook. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dave mentioned uh, a minute or so ago about joy. You talk about joy in your book and the double, maybe triple uh, benefit of uh, joy. Talk about that concept a little bit because I think all of us maybe need a little bit more joy in our lives these days. How do we manifest it? I think it's so important, especially today. Um, and so this is something that our brain is really hardwired to, to see the negative, right? This is just as humans, we're, um, we're able to, to cope and, and manage that way. So I think we need to actually intentionally take in um, joy and positive experiences, whether that's, um, you know, a brief interaction with a loved one or like Jake's example of uh, doing something that you're really passionate about and using that as an opportunity to learn and grow. Um, so I think, you know, whatever it is for you, I think really being intentional about being present for those moments of joy or intentionally carving out that time to, um, uh, you know, do something that that gives you that sense of that feeling of, of joy, whether it's, um, you know, with with someone or, or doing doing an activity that you really enjoy. And that joy, uh, of course, uh, uh, going to uh, mindfulness. Uh, Dr. Uh, Megan Smith, tell us a little bit uh, more about the Moms Organization uh, and how that uh, advocacy is, uh, I guess, uh, creating benefit uh, for all who are involved? 
Well, yeah, you were focused on um, it's mental health outreach for mothers partnership and, you know, started in Connecticut and New Haven and now in Connect, uh, Kentucky, Vermont, Washington, DC, soon to be New York City, where we're partnering with, with government agencies that actually serve families to, um, you know, as Dr. Jackie was talking about, really embed and interject mental health services and systems that um, support families that are really outside of the traditional mental health system. So, um, for example, our partners in Vermont are using our model, which is based on cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, using our model to provide services in supermarkets. And, and we've done that in, in New Haven, Connecticut as well. So thinking about um, you know, libraries as well, we're thinking about infusing mental health services for mothers and parents in the public library system. Um, but really understanding that connection, if we, if we improve the well-being of mothers, and particularly the Moms Partnership, particularly low-income mothers, we have a great potential for economic and social mobility for families too. So, you know, depression makes it hard to get a job and keep a job. Um, and so we really want to think about it, you know, those same skills that you need to cope with stress <clears throat> and depression are also the same kind of skills that, um, you know, you can translate into being um, parenting, uh, to being involved in your community. And so I think um, what we're focused on the Moms Partnership is really partnering with mothers, partnering with communities to improve mental well-being um, of mothers and making mental health for mothers ubiquitous um, and existing across communities. Yeah, and so it, it, as it relates, it's, um, it's not one thing, it's, it's, it's the whole thing. And we're all in this uh, together. Uh, speaking on uh, mental health, our jumping off point earlier was uh, the book, uh, The Wellbeing Playbook. Uh, you could get that at, uh, free uh, to download online. Uh, at we.org slash well-being. And now I want to bring Dr. Jackie back in here because bef uh, before we got started with our conversation, you really lit up on this book. So let's uh, let's help Lisa move a few uh, free downloads. Uh, this is something that, re that really spoke to you. Give us your uh, on-the-spot review. Okay, well, I will tell you this, and I said it earlier and I'll say it now. I First of all, schools cannot do this work alone. It's, it's, it's a great work. Um, we heard it again and again about resilience um, and also dealing with trauma, mental health, mental wellness, but we can't do this work by ourselves. And we need practical um, support strategies um, that work and that are also able to comprehend, you know, not these things that are just so difficult. You just need 10 scientists in the room to help you um, to, to understand and, and to get an understanding of. But I am just so excited about this playbook. Oh my gosh. And I'm going to tell you why. I love a few things and I'm going to just go ahead and read some. First of all, you mentioned um, the different quotes. Okay. One of the best quotes I saw in there was from Dr. Man Mandela, Nelson Mandela, that said, um, do not judge me by my success, but judge me by all of the times that I fell down and got back up again. That is exactly what resilience is, the ability to continue to get back up. Um, she mentioned about being your own BFF, as you mentioned, children. So great. Feeling confident, not just children, but, you know, all of us, right? This book is, I thought, great for everybody. Um, I learned about dopamine, which is, you know, when you're doing something pleasurable that's released in your brain and the plasticity of the brain and how the brain um, is a living organism and that can continue to grow every single day. Um, that's good to know. That goes back to something I was sharing about, you know, speaking into the life of young people and, and you know, developing their belief system about themselves. Um, and so I also love the power of yet. A simple word, but yet many possibilities. So telling our, our youth, you know, might not be there, but you're, you know, not yet. That means you're on the way. You know, I loved um, the SMART goals that were also in there. Doing the math on doing good. I mean, I love that. So it's not just about, you know, doing good for yourself, but doing good for some others. That, that means you're a multiplier of good. So that was just an eye opener to me. Um, starting with small steps self-care, um, you know, we mentioned the 10 happiest songs, but phone plus snub equals fub. Okay, I love that because that meant, you know, start putting the phone down and start to tune in. In fact, I love something else that was said in the book. 
don't just listen up, but listen deep. And that really made me think, how active is my listening? Am I really engaging um, to understand? Um, do I hear you? Because everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants to be acknowledged. Everybody wants to say, you know, listen, did you hear what I said? And I think those strategies, you know, will develop compassion. They will develop empathy. Um, and this is something that schools can do. Like I can see the playbook being used in any wellness center. We heard Megan talked about they're, they're popping up everywhere. You know, they're not just in schools. There are places where families go to. But, you know, to have this free, you know, and available and accessible, you know, I can't put this book down. I was on the phone with educators last night and I'm a person of ships. And as I mentioned, we need partners, you know, even, you know, with, with what we, I love the whole purpose of We Charity and I love the We Wellbeing understanding is that we need to partner to make this work because we don't have all the answers. We really do not. Um, but when we have students, you know, who are like Jake and who are very sharp, you know, we need some strategies on how we can better um, help them, um, support them in ways that we are probably lacking. So if we need to partner with some of these medical companies, um, individuals, philanthropists um, who want to support and work with us, that is what we should be, I think, as schools open to and also inviting them in to say, let's do this work together and great things will happen. Well, thank you. Couldn't get a better endorsement on that. Uh, <laughs> so, so there is that. Uh, uh, Dr. Dave Anderson, let, let's return uh, uh, inside uh, the classroom. The question, uh, we're actually starting to get some uh, questions from uh, our PBS Books viewers. So we uh, invite you uh, to uh, select uh, a question option, click it, send it on through, and we'll uh, hopefully we'll uh, get to it before our time is through. Uh, Dave, uh, the, the question is, um, about those strategies, what strategies are working well? Is there evidence of particular uh, themes uh, and outcomes that can represent something that's scalable uh, for the rest of us? Absolutely, I'll tell you, it's, it's hard to follow my fellow panelists. In particular, uh, Dr. Megan and Dr. Jackie's last couple answers, you know, my, my microphone's not muted and I keep wanting to clap, but you know, I realize applause is not to, so much the part of like COVID, you, uh, you know, related <laughs> things, right, right. But, but yeah, exactly, we can do the, the kind of signals. But no, I mean, I mean, in terms of things that are working right now, uh, so many mental health organizations like uh, my own, the Child Mind Institute, like uh, one that I know Dr. Megan is affiliated with, the Yale Child Study Center, we're all trying to pivot to figure out the most creative ways to serve uh, you know, great community needs through telehealth. And I think that's become something where uh, we have legislation on our side that has relaxed kind of the boundaries for that in terms of helping us to establish how we can be confidential and private and also kind of move across uh, state lines and providing services to those who need them the most. Uh, but, but clinicians are getting very creative in that regard, trying to figure out uh, ways to bring costs down to, to make it so that there's, uh, you know, organizations like Crisis Text Line, uh, organizations like our own, where we've set up a service for flat fee parent consultations uh, around COVID related stressors, or we've created uh, free lines for frontline mental health professionals experiencing stress during this time. Um, and at the same time, I mean, it goes back to what we're discussing here, which is free resources. You know, it's wonderful that you can have a well-being, a, a, well, a, a playbook that uh, you can download for free. So much of our work right now is trying to take what we might utilize in one situation to support a particular population, package it and provide it for free online. So we've, we've collated resources on our website, childmind.org, for articles about how to talk to children about what's going on, articles about how to deal with certain stressors. Uh, we do free Facebook Lives uh, every day, uh, talking about different topics related to the crisis. Uh, and we, we try to make sure that uh, even if people find that they may not have access to services or, or can't afford them, we find creative ways to still serve their communities, whether it's through connections with their mentors, counselors, educators, anybody else who can get online or has access at this time. But that's, that's really what's going to work. It's going to be elbow grease and technology right now. Yeah, it, it, thank you for that, uh, uh, Dr. Dave. Uh, Jake, let me, let me bring you in here. Uh, a lot of adults uh, spending their careers digging deep into science and education uh, and empowerment. Uh, you are in the educational setting. 
what is working uh, for you? I know you attend an art school, but for you and you, your other students, uh, fellow students, are there things that are working uh, that you're happy with when it comes to mental health care? And then uh, the inverse of that is, are there things that you would love to see? What would be uh, on your dream board uh, of something that could make an appreciable difference uh, right away for you uh, at 17, right in the heart uh, of high school? Um, well, for me, I think that my school does a, a, a very good job of um, connecting students and teachers. Um, and for me, I feel like that um, the way to really help a student is through conversation. Um, so having those open conversations between teachers and students. Um, and it's hard. Um, I, I know that it's also hard for teachers to um, connect with students uh, at times. But um, I know that uh, I try my hardest to um, sort of be open and honest with my teachers and um, being able to have that conversation, um, I think really sort of uh, uh, relieves some stress. Um, and I think that um, also at my school, we have a, um, we have counselors that help with um, specific uh, needs. Um, and so uh, I have ADHD and um, need extra time. And so, especially over Corona, um, I, uh, this counselor has been really helpful um, in checking in with me and making sure I'm uh, staying up on my work and um, not slipping behind, which has been very helpful for me. Um, and so I really just think that, um, uh, the way to, uh, sort of let a student, uh, like relieve that stress is to have the conversations and, um, sort of push those conversations out, even if it's a little, um, uncomfortable at times and, um, just sort of ask the students how they're doing and, um, what it's like in other classes. Um, and just sort of making sure that it's not overwhelming. Well, I can almost uh, hear our experts uh, fiercely writing down uh, your comments to add to their studies. Uh, uh, Dr. Megan Smith, can I bring you back in here? I, I'm wondering, uh, turning off of Jake's uh, question as a follow-up, uh, counselors, uh, are, are, there an, are there enough? Uh, how could we make sure there are more? Uh, uh, that seems to be key. It's so key. Um, you know, one of the strategies that's worked globally that we've adapted in some of our work and others are looking at is to train um, people who are community leaders, who are lay health workers, so non-mental um, health professionals to actually deliver services, um, you know, either in conjunction with mental health professionals or, um, you know, out in the community. And so people who are community leaders, for example, we have a program called Community Mental Health Ambassadors. Um, training people in the community to really engage and make it so that mental health is more appropriate or um, you know, culturally equivalent in certain examples. So I think those ideas, it's called task shifting or task sharing, um, you know, are great examples of the way that we can improve the mental health workforce um, and bring capacity, increase capacity. Uh, thank you, doctor, for that. I, it's. Uh... It's great to be able uh, in this, uh, the context of this discussion here on uh, PBS Books, here in Mental uh, Health Month, uh, but important all year long, uh, to create uh, this bridge between student uh, and this panel of experts. Uh, uh, Dr. Jackie, you, yes. talk about, you talk about resiliency. Um, let's, let's talk about that. Here, here's, I guess my question, and, and certainly from reading from the Wellbeing uh, Playbook kind of informs this, when do we know whether to shield our child from some adverse situation or to have them battle it to build strength? Is there a way that we can know whether to let them fight or hold them back? Oh, well, um, that's a great question. Um, and one that is continuing um, and will continue to the acts. Um, you know, one of the, the greatest things that I think I do um, with my business, the Why Not Incubator, is 
being able to train um, families and educators around that very same question um, and others. Um, you know, when do we intervene um, and when do we allow them to um, kind of power through it, um, for lack of a better word? Um, you know, both answers are correct. And we're, it's, it's really goes back to also knowing, um, like, I just love Jake, by the way. I wish I could clone Jake. Jake is like a fabulous student, right? Um, but he mentioned something about conversations. And when we start having conversations with um, the young people that we work with, it will tell us um, and guide us and clue us um, as to the gaps that they have that we need to intervene. Does that make sense? Meaning um, in the conversations, we'll learn um, their strengths and their weaknesses, um, the areas, their areas that they're challenged in on how to communicate um, and whether or not they have the strength to actually um, face something on their own. On, on their own. It will also us as educators, families, parents, um, the more we know our, um, the youth that we work with um, and that we are so honored to serve, um, the more we know them, the more it will give us, um, and the more we have conversations, and we know this, we'll have this conversation. Conversations is what opens up the door for us to get to know them and will help us to know. Because there are times when, for example, I'll give an example, my son um, who um, also, you know, is, he's 14, he has challenges and um, for all parents, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. And we always wanna run to um, their defense. But with that being said, they will not strengthen that muscle as we heard from Lisa earlier, you know, that. We want that, that resilience muscle is one that needs also resistance. So when we can resist helping them on everything, letting them be the problem solvers that they are, even as Jake said, when it's uncomfortable, because oftentimes it's uncomfortable and we want to solve all of their problems, but that will make them weaker. It might make them wiser and not a good way either. So, but we want them to be strong. And so by doing that, um, we cannot have them be problem solvers if they're never able to solve a problem. Um, and so I hope that it's, I know that was a big answer to a question, but it's, it's such one that there's no clear cut um, defined answer, which is why it will continuously be a conversation. But I think it does, the heart of it is really getting to know, having conversations, and that will give us a clue um, as to what to do. Yeah, no, I think I got the answer. Your curricular approach uh, is, if you don't know, uh, have a conversation, ask them, yeah. they will tell you in some uh, manner or other. I got some questions coming up uh, uh, for, uh, for Lisa. Is there gonna be a Spanish language uh, version of the book? Uh, um, Yes, great question. So we're working on um, uh, different languages right now. So we'll keep you posted on that. All right, that's that's excellent. Uh, more information, of course, at we.org slash uh, well-being, the well-being uh, playbook. Uh, so we're running uh, short on time, it would appear. Uh, so I want to I want to wrap it up on a question for everyone and we'll go through and get your individual answers. But I think this is critical. Uh, one of the viewers wrote in all this is great information. How to bridge the gap from school support to over the summer until school starts again uh, in September or August or when we get back to the classroom. Uh, Dr. Megan Smith, let me start with you on that question. You know, I think I guess two things there. One would be if, if the question is really around, you know, the academic piece of that is thinking about life skills. So what are the other life skills you can help impart with your children over the summer. Um, you know, is it being intellectually curious and being out um, in the in the yard looking um, for different things in nature? But you know, other life skills is it is it helping someone build a fence? Um, there's there's many different life skills that, that teach inhibitory control and you know um, prioritizing and multitasking. I think there's another part of the question which is you know how do you continue that maybe emotional support school is providing. And, and that is really thinking about actually a project we did with PBS um, around you know, Big Bird and Comfy Cozy Nests. 
And I think that idea of how do you uh, get a comfy, cozy nest for, for yourself, for your child, no matter what age, there's a comfy, cozy nest, a, a safe place, um, you know, that you have, um, that your child has that can go to. So even an adolescent um, can have a comfy, cozy nest that you can impart over the summer. Uh, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, Dr. Dave Anderson, the same question to you. Uh, what should we do, prioritize over the summer to keep strong in the sense of uh, mental health and emotional support? That was already such a, a perfect answer for kind of how to implement structure. And I think, I think to give uh, you know, some parents at least some sense that like they're going to find ways to structure time if summer camps aren't happening or if they're not you know, uh, certain activities that we might otherwise be occupied with during the summer. Um, I think in, in many ways, we're looking for that shared enjoyment uh, activities. Uh, so we're, we're asking many families that we work with to take looks at, resor at resources online, all kinds of different family activities one can do together and look for the development of shared passions in the sense that we know that's gonna, do, that's gonna promote relationship development, it's gonna decrease stress overall, it's gonna make it so when you have to move through tasks or household chores or other things, you at least have this kind of like, you know, uh, relational fuel in the tank, at least for a little while. The other major point I think we're making to folks uh, about the summer is in the midst of coping with all this uncertainty, uh, perfectionism and the coronavirus don't mix. Um, so in, in that sense, we're not going to check every box. <laughs> not everyone's going to be happy all the time. We're not going to have days that are fully without tears, you know, the entire summer. Uh, and, and we're not going to have days when we're not bored or when we're, we're not feeling, uh, you know, increased stress related to what's going on. So in many ways, I think what we're trying to help people think through is the idea that there's only so much occupying themselves that they can do. And then at the same time, there's just getting through, bending together and realizing that, uh, you know, boredom is kind of okay. <laughs> and in, in terms of this generation, you know, uh, one of the, the complaints we often get is that boredom is not something that many young people are that acquainted with in the digital age. Uh, right. Now's the time to learn that skill. Mm. Oh, well, Dr. Day, that was a pretty perfect answer. Don't sell yourself, right. Jordan. Thank you. Uh, I just that. like everything the panelists are saying, and I agree. Like, Jake, I, I really want to bring you on the road. You know, this is great. <laughs> hey, Dr. Jackie, what are you thinking for over the summer? What's key? Well, I think this is a good time to bring back the arts um, as well. Um, I think our young people, all of us too, need opportunities to express ourselves, do something different that we don't always get a chance to do. Um, so clear everything off the dining room table. Bring some paper, some pencils, some art supplies and just go at it. You know, have a singing night, a talent show night in the family. You know, something that will also just allow everybody just to act silly and have a lot of fun. Um, as, as I cannot agree um, with Dr. Dave, you know, my son has been saying the word bored at least 16 times a day. Um, and so, you know, they have to get used to just being quiet. Um, and when I'm, I'm really, really old. So years ago, I remember my parents used to say, sit down for five minutes and say nothing. That was the longest five minutes ever. But one of the things that it taught us is that you're not going to be doing something all the time. So let's just encourage them to, um, you know, I, I just think the arts really do need to come back and it allows, and, and again, we will find out um, each of their talents sometimes, skills and abilities and gifts that we did not know that were dormant, that could come out, out of all of this ugliness, something positive can come out. Wow, uh, yeah, from your lips. Uh, uh, Jake Tolman, let me bring you in here. What can we do for you uh, as a community over the summer? Uh, that could keep reinforcing these things that are so important. Um, well, for me, uh, what I'm planning on doing um, is, uh, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, um, and like Dr. Jackie mentioned, is trying to um, continue my uh, projects and passions. And if you don't know what those, those are yet, uh, I would just say like experimenting with like what you have. I know um, some of my friends have taken up like embroidering and um, just like so many different hobbies oh. and trying to um, uh, find something um, that you love to do to fill up that time is um, really important right now. And um, the other thing I would say is um, uh, trying to keep a connection because um, while we while we're stuck with our family and we um, are building that connection, um, as someone who has moved schools um, multiple times, 
um, I've had to make new connections. And this year, um, I felt like I really started to make a, a strong connection with my friends. And, um, and then Corona happened and it, it felt like um, that was kind of put on pause. And so for the first few weeks, it just felt like that was, that was like, it, it like it, it just, it, it was gone. That connection was gone, but um, trying to build uh, or not build, but um, keep those connections intact and stay in touch with um, friends um, and just make sure that you, you don't like lose that um, uh, spark in a friendship um, is really important. Um, and yeah, just trying to uh, fill up as much time uh, as you can with um, going outside and um, finding new projects um, is what my advice would be. Well, you, uh, thank you for that, Jake. And um, though some of the connections have been lost, you certainly made a strong uh, connection here with our, our panel uh, and our viewers. I guess uh, we end uh, where we began. Uh, Lisa Kurswell Kleberger, one final question regarding uh, this playbook. Uh, tell us one more time where folks uh, can get it. Uh, so thank you. So it's free downloadable online at we.org forward slash well-being. Uh, and it is an inspiration. Uh, great thanks to uh, our entire panel, Lisa Kurswell Kleberger, uh, Dr. Megan Smith, Dr. Dave Anderson, uh, Dr. Jackie, uh, and Jake Tolman. My great thanks for being with us here on PBS uh, Books from all of us at PBS Books. I'm Fred Nahat. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next time.